world and that they really don't want to stand in the way. They really don't want to squelch this. Um, we'll see, you know, and Obama certainly knows the history of Hawaii. So we're hoping that while he's in office, you know, we'll bring things to fruition and have someone that's at least, you know, knowledgeable about what the, what the history is and why this is a legitimate political effort, uh, what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. So how can people get involved locally? Um, we are reworking the website right now. And uh, in the very near future, actually you can go on the website right now and send an email and say you're interested in getting involved. So it's kingdomofhawaii.info and there is a contact uh, link. You can send a, a, an email to us and we will get to you as soon as we can. Uh, we're a relatively small group now. Uh, the resources are arriving for us to become a much larger group. We will be recruiting people for offices in the government and we'll be recruiting people to implement the projects that we're going to be funding. So we'd love to have people so, uh, actually send us a resume, you know, mm -hmm. attach that to your email if you can or, or put it in the body of the email so we can see what your skills are. Tell us what you'd like to do, you know, what your passion is. I mean, that, that's a whole other thing we're trying to do here. We know there's lots of people doing things that are not their passion. And they're just going through daily life, you know, working, paying their bills and like that, and really would love to have a more meaningful life. We hope that we're going to put out a vision and have a project here that's going to be an inspiration for people to live a whole different kind of life. And that they're going to find when they make the transition into the kingdom, if they really make the transition, that they have a whole new relationship with the planet. They have a whole new relationship with the world of spirit. Uh, that's a whole other thing that's come now. I mean, that the ancient Hawaiian religions were suppressed. And this is an internal Hawaiian thing. The missionaries came and they converted the Hawaiian political leadership to Christianity and taught them that the traditional practitioners were agents of the devil. So Hawaiian Christians hunted down and killed the kahunas of the traditional religion. And it was a huge battle, 60,000 people died when a Christian Hawaiian army fought a traditionalist Hawaiian army. And after that, the traditionalists all went underground. The kahunas all went underground. And they passed on the teachings to one or two students and kept the religion alive, but when they walked out of their front door, they were just a fisherman or a farmer or whatever. People in the community knew who they were, but they were no longer practicing in public. In 1972, some of them started to come back out. So the Temple of Lono came out, and they have been stepping forward and reclaiming their sacred sites. Uh, and we, we're now dealing with you know the US government that has some of the sacred sites in their national park system trying to get them to transition those out and back to the traditional practitioners. And they're digging in their eels and saying, no, you can't do this, and saying we have to have a permit to go on to the land and all that kind of stuff. But that's a whole other topic. But the, the opportunity to learn about the Hawaiian faith, I think, will be one of the really fun things also about the, the kingdom. Because that faith will be back out and talking about the relationship between people and the earth and the spirit world. What kind of timeline are you projecting for any? I think Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, for changes, but we, we, have, we have had so many frustrating experiences of setting timelines that we gave it up. Mm -hmm. um, however, I am, I am really at a high level of confidence that within the next six weeks, you are going to see major things happening in the islands that will be the, basically the announcement of what's coming. Um, we have projects already on the books that are being implemented right now. One project alone that will probably eventually employ 100,000 people. So it's that level of activity that's coming around the corner. Uh, I will say too that we want, we want to open doors that have been closed on areas like alternative energies. There, there's Tesla and all that um, that was basically suppressed. We think there's things out there in electromagnetic energies and magnetic fields that are the solution to some of the problems we face on the planet. And we are going to put resources into bringing together the people that understand those technologies and seeing if they can move them into reality for us. Um, there's, there's plenty of people out there that have an understanding. And this is like alternative medicines as well. We, we know that eventually the medicinal system in the islands will be a blend of all the different disciplines that have happened. And if you really, the, the great tragedy of what went on when the Europeans encountered the Hawaiians was they had no idea what they had encountered. 
They encountered a people with an incredibly sophisticated, sophisticated medicinal system, a highly developed political system, a highly developed social system that had resolved many of the problems that you now see coming up in Western civilization. They resolved these long ago. Because when you're on an island, and it's just you and that island, you figure things out or you, know, you don't make it. So they figured things out, the, the social issues and all of that. And then the Europeans came and passed laws even outlawed, outlawed ancestor worship, for example. Outlawed the Hanai system, where people with three children might give one of their children to a family that had no children, so at least they'd have a child to raise. They outlawed that. So they outlawed the hula. I mean, they, all of this kind of thing that went on was an attempt to destroy that civilization, but that civilization was too resilient. So the, the restoration effort has been visible for many years here. You've seen the hula come back, you've seen the fish ponds come back, the taro fields coming back, the traditional medicinal practitioners coming out. So the, the groundwork is being laid one stone at a time. So, and we feel like the foundation is in place and it's time to actually let this whole thing bloom. You can see in the history some of the evidence of, you know, despite the destruction of the culture, the, the fruits of it in, in the people, their, their intelligence, their, you know, their ability to orient to the, to the whole world of, of politics, that, that, that in the 1800s, the, the nation of Hawaii was, I think, the number six nation invited to join, sort of the equivalent of the United Nations at that time was the, uh, the family of nations. Mm. So they were considered highly advanced well, highly as a so culture, yes. even though the, yeah. the original culture was suppressed, the and people the, and the, the, the internal there. culture. The and, and that's Manau. because the, the root was in the faith. Mm -hmm. And the faith was in aloha. Mm -hmm. And aloha is a word that's not necessarily well understood. The kahuna of the Temple of Lono teaches that the word aloha was never spoken because it was an attempt to characterize a situation in which you were filled with the divine spirit or you witnessed someone else who was filled with the divine spirit. And it was a, a, an experience beyond words. But if you said aloha, you knew that's what you were referring to. But aloha was a lower energy than that experience. It was a word. So the word was never really spoken in those days. Now it's come out and it's been painted on the side of airplanes and put on you know, beer bottles or whatever. And that's okay, because people are at least have the word. Now they can begin to learn what the word really means. And I had a warrior, a Hawaiian warrior, say that his teaching about aloha was he has his spear. And if someone comes at him aggressively, he drops the spear and says aloha and backs up. And if they come at him aggressively again, he drops the spear and backs up and says aloha. He's giving them every opportunity to get it right and learn aloha. And that's part of what we will be trying to do with the folks who are involved with us. Is get, it's like the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the Roll Commission, all those people involved in trying to create the nation within a nation have lost their way. And we are putting that in their face, very, very frankly, that the ancestors made the decision when they signed the Kuei petition saying we don't want to be annexed. They put down their marker and said, we don't want to be annexed. To say, well, okay, we got annexed, and so now we're going to be a nation within a nation and give up on independence is to betray the ancestors. And we're putting that up in their face, but we're putting it up in their face to say, look, there's this other path, which is the real path of Aloha. Honor the ancestors. Achieve what they couldn't achieve. Let's get this nation back on track and let it be a light unto the world. Then you will have taught Aloha to the world, which is our job because we understand it, we have to share it. So that's all part of what we're trying to do as well. I love how people are called to Hawaii. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not always like a logical decision. Yeah, no. It's people just feel pulled here. No, I was, I I was part of the restoration. It's, I was asked to come to Hawaii. I was living in Portland, Oregon. I was asked to come to Hawaii and testify at a hearing before the county council on the spaceport plan back in the early 90s. And I flew in here, and I was here for two and a half days. I flew back to Portland, packed up, and moved. <laughs> and I was like, over here, boy. And um, we opened a, a spiritual center in Hilo in the early 90s, a lightworker center. Mm -hmm. uh, that was quite an experience. We had teachers and healers from all over the world coming for day and night presentations for three years. And there was a, a Hawaiian man, a Makua, that used to come, and he would sit on the back porch, and I'd sit out there and talk to him. 
And one day he said, you know, we have the word howling, which originally just meant foreigner. They weren't Kamaina, they weren't of the land. Uh, and then it got all kinds of negative connotations when people came and just took, took, took. You know, they weren't there to, to aloha anybody, they were there to enrich themselves and to hell with the Aina and everybody else. Um, but he said in the early 1970s, people started to come who were coming to help, who were drawn here, felt called here, felt they'd lived here lifetimes in the past, and that those people were going to merge with the Hawaiian people and bring about the transition that was going to happen. And that the Hawaiians called those people halami, which meant gift of heaven. So there, there were the two kinds of people. And the, 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 the real haoles, when, when the kingdom is coming forward, they will be going out the door. And the real halanis will be going, oh, at last. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> we've been waiting for this ever since we came to the island. I didn't know why I was here, but I knew I had to be here and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They will know why they're here. So we want you to think about your highest expression, your best use of your hot, your breath, your life, uh, and then bring that to the kingdom and let's, let's party. <laughs> I was drawn here from Portland, Oregon myself. Uh -huh. I uh, was busy studying and healing, and a Hawaiian family came to me and invited me to tag along to Hawaii. I'd never been here. And okay, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going. But yeah. I really like the idea of you talking about the land only belongs to the God. That's what I always thought about, like land shouldn't be, not belong to anyone, it's belong to the earth. Yeah. So maybe the, the spirit of nature called me something. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I love nature and I love Hawaiian people so connected to the nature and they always ask permission before they go to the field and then walk on the land. Before, no, do, they don't do big ceremony or anything but they just in their heart yeah. and they do everything from the heart so I was very touched yeah. by yeah those people yeah. are you going to live in Hawaii yeah you are. <laughs> <laughs> Good. welcome well I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave you with one story because this is for me one of the real formative parts of my experience in Hawaii um, in in a previous life I was a lawyer I don't do that anymore but I did it for a while and when I came to the islands, uh, one day I got a call saying that the U.S. Navy was coming to the islands to test their low-frequency active sonar on the humpback whales during their breeding and birthing season. And uh, the first meeting they held on the islands almost turned into a riot because our relationship with the whales is very strong. And we thought they were just unbelievably rude. Um, and it, it turned into a whole movement. We, we were putting people in the water around their radar, around their sonar boat so they couldn't turn it on and all that kind of stuff. So I sued them, and um, five times and during, the, during the testing. I sued them five different times for different reasons. But while I was suing them, one day I was on a boat off the coast of Hilo, about three miles out in the ocean, and the first thing we saw were these spotted dolphins coming group of about nine spotted dolphins. And folks jumped into the water to say hi to the dolphins. And the dolphins formed a circle. And they were all going like this in the same direction. And everybody's looking like, what? What are they what are they pointing at? Well here came three humpback whales. And my first experience was a baby humpback whale about 30 feet below me doing a complete 360 degree barrel roll. <laughs> Just left me laughing so hard I had to take my snorkel out. And I got back in the boat and then I got out of the boat. And the energy changed really significantly. And suddenly it was forceful waves knocking me away from the boat and out into the open ocean. And I was wave, whale calling, you know. Mm. And this big adult surfaced underneath me and swam at my speed about 15 feet below me. And then he went out ahead of me, turned around, came straight back at me, turned and looked me in the eye and ran his fluke over my head. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know, astonished. <laughs> the water around me didn't move. It was like a knife through warm butter. But it was like, thank you, you know, for what you're doing. We want to show you who we really are, that this is our realm and we are masters of this realm. Mm -hmm. And when you look into the eye of a whale, it's a life-changing experience. 
and you gain a, an incredibly deep love for this planet that nurtures us, and you're, you're fiercely ready to defend it and protect it. And we are, nonviolently, fiercely ready to defend it and protect it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.